Uh, welcome everyone. So in planning, the modeling team um, thought about ways to collaborate with the early career team, and but also to uh, think about ways to focus and recognize uh, graduate student early career research. Um, we get a lot of demographic uh, information, and one of the things was to, that we should uh, try to emphasize the more of the the graduate student and early career uh, groups. So we went through. We we just decided as a test here. We went through the student papers that were submitted to the fall AGU meeting, uh, looking for, looking for modeling and Arctic themes, and we arrived at a short list of of uh, of people who of stu um, I think this was for the Outstanding Student Paper Award. I went through that list and I arrived at a short list and we got four positive responses and we'll present those today. So we recognize that there are other papers, of course, and other meetings, including the AMS annual meeting uh, being held up the road in Baltimore here next week. So uh, we may do this again periodically, but we thought we would try this out today. Uh, so we're motivated to include graduate student and early career scientists in our team. Student and early career work are windows to the directions for future high latitude research and to the personnel that will be providing a long-term Arctic research capacity. So I'll now ask uh, Alex to say a few words for the early career community of practice, Alex. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we're really excited when the modeling team reached out to the early career community of practice um, to share the work of early career and graduate students. Um, so the Early Career Community of Practice, we work to promote the work of early career members within the IRFIC community and beyond. Uh, we hope to provide opportunities for early career researchers to engage meaningfully with IRFIC, the IRFIC community, including mid and later career folks um, by promoting network opportunities and sharing their research. And so we do have a number of events coming up later this spring. Uh, so do join the early career community of practice, even if you're not an early career person, so you can share these opportunities with other people. Um, and yeah, look forward to doing more collaborative meetings in the future. Thanks, Alex. That sounds great. I think we should think about uh, how to collaborate again um, this this year or or sometime later uh, later this year. All right, so let's get started then. Uh, since we have a limited amount of time, this will be kind of like the um, lightning presentations at AGU, except without the big screens. Well, I guess if you have a big screen, it would be like that. Um, so our first uh, presentation will be by Hannah Mevenkamp. She's from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and she'll, presenting on, she'll be presenting on the Arctic ecosystem modeling, what role can paleo history play in reducing model uncertainty? Uh, Hannah, who is your advisor at uh, UAF? Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. My advisor is Eugenie Euskirchen. Okay, great. And would you care to share your screen then? Yes. All right, the obligatory Zoom question. Can you all see my screen? That looks good. Perfect. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this and for having me today. Um, as you said, I'm from Fairbanks, so I live and work on the ancestral homelands of the Lower Tanana Diné. And my topic that I'm going to be talking about is Arctic ecosystem modeling and the role that paleohistory may play in reducing model uncertainty. And at this point, I also really want to thank my co-authors, um, Toby Carmen, Helen Janay, Ruth Rudder, Sean Serbin, and Eugenie Euskirchen. So um, as all of you are probably aware, um, Ecosystem modeling can be an extremely useful tool for so many situations. However, in order to make sure that we're using it appropriately, we need to better understand the full range of uncertainties that these models are associated with. And I think that paleo history may play a pretty big role in that. But before I dive too deep into that, um, I just want to give a quick overview about the Arctic terrestrial ecosystem model that I work with, DVM DOS TEM. TEM is a process-based ecosystem model, and it has a really detailed representation of Arctic vegetation. Um, it has a fully resolved soil column that does include permafrost and carbon and nutrient fluxes, and it also has wildfire disturbance. So as far as ecosystem models go, it's actually pretty well suited to represent the Arctic, but it is obviously still associated with a decent amount of uncertainty. And model uncertainty can come from many different sources, and three of the most important ones are structural, initial conditions, and parameter-based uncertainties. And today I'll be focusing on the initial conditions, which are often a little bit underestimated in modeling. Um, 
Also, initial conditions in modeling look a little bit different than they look in the real world because it is pretty much impossible to give the model all the information there is to know about the pre-industrial state of the world. So instead, what we do is that we create the model and we run it for thousands of years with pre-run equilibrium and spin-up with climate from the 1900s usually. And that is usually sufficient in a lot of ecosystems. But the Arctic specifically has a really long thermal memory. And therefore, it might be necessary to go back a little bit further, specifically to the last glacial maximum, where a lot of the Arctic was covered by an ice sheet as indicated by the white. But specifically in Alaska, a lot of areas also remained unglaciated and therefore were potentially exposed to much colder air temperatures. Um, and that might have led to also where we now find the Yeroma permafrost reserves, as indicated by the orange. So our hypothesis now was that if we run the model with paleoclimate, so if we tell the model that there was an ice age, that we would get to a better representation of permafrost. So for example, colder permafrost, deeper permafrost, and maybe also permafrost that is more resilient going into the future. So we decided to test that at three different sites throughout the state. And what we did is that we created paleoclimate scenarios and we set the last glacial maximum to be up to 10 degrees colder than pre-industrial conditions. Then we gradually increased the temperature until we had a Holocene, um, modeled the Holocene, and the, then modeled the recent increase in temperature plus some projection until the year 2100. And then we looked at the soil temperature throughout the soil column at the year 2100. And the first site that we looked at was in Naviet Creek. Um, the climate there is pretty cold and the community type is dominated by tussock, heath and wet sedge tundra. And the permafrost is also continuous. And the results that we found were not quite what we were expecting. So first of all, we can see that there is no geothermal gradient. Um, that is because models like TEM were not designed to be run with soil columns of 100 meters. And therefore that is a process that is just missing at the moment, but I will be planning on adding it in the near future. Um, besides that though, the lower soil layers actually do look like we expect them to. The colder paleoclimate scenarios are leading to colder soil temperatures. In the top of soil layers, however, um, while it starts out that way in the year two, um, un up until the year 2000, um, in the last 100 years of the model run, it actually inverts and the paleoclimate scenarios that were colder actually lead to warmer soils. So this is really not what we're expecting and this seems to be a really interesting phenomenon. And we decided to look into that a little bit further at a site that is warmer because we expect the permafrost there to be a little bit more widespread by the year 2100. And so we looked at the Bonanza Creek LTER, which is close to Fairbanks. The climate there is still cold, but not quite as cold anymore. And it is dominated by boreal black spruce forest and the permafrost there is discontinuous. And if possible, these results puzzled us even more <laughs> because none of the um, paleoclimate scenarios for RAN, including one that was said to be minus 15 degrees Celsius colder, had any impact on the soil temperatures in the year 2100. We think that there might be some other effects going on, potentially related to the peat accumulation that are stronger than paleo impacts and are masking any impacts. Um, that is also supported by the fact that the soil temperatures in Bonanza Creek are colder than at any other black spruce site in the state. Um, but overall, the site did not really help us solve our paleo questions. So we look further um, close to a, a, to a site close to the community of St. Mary's. The climate there is a little bit warmer and more coastal. The community type is dominated by boreal deciduous forest, shrub tundra, and wet sedge tundra, and the permafrost is discontinuous or sporadic. And here we see a behavior very similar to the top layers at Imnaviat Creek. So the control run in the paleoclimate scenario of minus 2.5 degrees Celsius have a soil column that's almost entirely at zero degrees Celsius. However, once we pass the threshold and get to the colder scenarios of minus five and lower, we see a distinct shift happening and almost the entire soil column now is at temperatures of above zero, indicating a loss of almost all permafrost by the year 2100. So again, we see the shift happening of the colder um, climate scenarios are leading to warmer soil temperatures. So overall, what are the conclusions? We can see that two out of the three sites that we looked at do show an effect when they're run with paleoclimate and that effect is up to seven degrees Celsius of difference. 
we see that paleo history may make permafrost layers more vulnerable to thaw than anticipated from traditional modeling. And that is a result that we really didn't expect. We actually expected quite the opposite. But it is um, we it is similar to what we see in this paper by Ryan Kelly et al., um, where sites that had recently undergone a shift in fire regime were subsequently more vulnerable to carbon loss. So this is a behavior that might be really important to consider. Um, and what we can definitely say is that initial conditions based on certainty in modeling is not negligible and may need to be considered more frequently. Overall, this project is still very much ongoing and there's a lot of questions that I still need to ask myself. Um, for and foremost, I wanna answer the question, where and when should paleo history be considered in order to reduce model uncertainty? And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much to my funding source. And I hope we can talk about some questions later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna. So um, if you have a question, you can, um, I think you can go ahead and unmute and get our attention. Um, Hannah, just a few questions about uh, your model. So the, the boundary conditions that you're reading in then are the, the temperature. Is there anything else that, uh, that your model reads in to establish um, the, the paleo conditions? In this case, we're focusing mainly on the um, temperature. I'm also interested in um, changing the pre um, precipitation parameters a little bit. And there's also the near infrared radiation um, that I played around with a little bit, but it seems to be that temperature is the most important factor okay. for um, modeling this specific and, scenario. And so for the sites you chose then, um, that suggests that those those sites are locations where you can reconstruct the, the paleo record then because there is there is some proxy data for those locations then. Is that is that how those locations were selected? Um, those locations were mainly selected based on we have data that we can now compare to our outputs for the future. Um, it, it There is actually quite a bit of disagreement about how cold the last glacial maximum was specifically in Alaska. And so that's also where the different scenarios are coming from. All of these temperatures have been suggested somewhere in the literature. Um, so yeah, um, site selection is based on just sparse data availability. Okay. Any other questions for Hannah? Uh, hi, Hannah. Uh, hi. Uh, very interesting uh, study. So I wonder, uh, does your model have uh, received feedback from like uh, between atmosphere and the ecosystem? And also you focus on Alaska area. Does it have like feedback from climate change over the entire globe? So it is, we can generally model sites um, across the circumpolar Arctic. Um, however, the sites in, we focus mostly on Alaska. And so for that, those are the sites that are calibrated at the moment. I do want to look at other sites throughout the circumpolar Arctic and potentially look at some sites that were glaciated um, versus unglaciated. Um, and yeah, there is, there is some interaction with the atmosphere, yes. Okay, yeah, I was particularly interested in see if they, the thaw of the uh, permafrost will release like greenhouse gases and then further feedback on. Yeah, I I definitely want to look at the carbon balance a little bit more detail as well. Um, as of now, temperature is where we got, and we think that's a pretty good indicator of thinking about the um, carbon balance. But yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Hannah? You can also submit questions to the chat for Hannah, uh, or I believe her contact information is on the, the webpage as well. If you have questions or want to follow up with Hannah at a later time, you can do that as well. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Maria uh, Luisa Rocha Santos de Silva. Yeah. Hello. Can I just call you Maria? Yeah, this Maria is fine. Okay. And you are from Brown University, and yes. the title of your talk is Enhancing CMIP-6 Models, Model Sea Ice Concentration with Machine Learning on the Northern Sea Route. Yes. And Maria, who is your advisor? Um, Amanda Lynch. I think that means we're related. All right. <laughs> yeah, we are. 
Okay, I can see your slides. You can go ahead. Okay, let me just, um, let me see. Can I see, can you see my slides? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Luisa Rocha. Um, thank you for the invitation. I was looking forward for today. Um, my work is enhancing resolution of CI's concentration with machine learning in the Norton Sea Route. And let me see. The Norton Sea Route is the shipping route that passes for the most part in the north coast of Russia and has several uh, advantages when compared to more traditional shipping routes that connect Asia, Europe, and America. Um, CI's loss due to anthropogenic climate change has made the shipping route accessible for longer periods of time within a year, and that result in a surge usage of the shipping route in the past years, uh, risk to the environment, ecosystem, and even conflicts with indigenous populations that live in this region. And because of that, there is this increased demand for shipping route planning in this region. And um, that leads me to the question, how does retreating of sea ice influence marine accessibility in the Northern Sea Route? And to do that, I need to understand how um, and when Northern Sea Route is going to be accessible. So research with shipping accessibility models in the Arctic that depends on daily sea ice concentration, ice type and vessel class that use semi six models that are a set of experiments that help us understand how climate is changing. Uh, indicates that not only for now, but also in the future, the Arctic vessels navigate through narrow passages called the Straits in the Northern Sea Group. But the problem with that is that semi six models do not represent the Straits. And here I have this table with the width of some of the main Straits of the Northern Sea Route. This first row is the actual width. And here I have some of the semi six models that are they not represent the straits or they are artificially widened to be represented. And I have the example of the Vutikiski Strait and the red dots are um, the grid points of one of the semi six models. And as we can see, it's not calculating sea ice um, in the strait. So how can I improve the representation of sea ice concentration in the Northern Sea Route Straits? Um, to address this, I'm using a machine learning algorithm more specifically, a super resolution GAN. That is an um, algorithm that increases resolutions of images, but here I'm using to increase resolution of CI's concentration in this trait. And this algorithm is built in two parts. So I have the generator and the discriminator. And the generator is trained to create a super resolution image from a low resolution image. And the discriminator is trained to discriminate between the original image and the super resolution image that the generator created. And then gives a feedback signal to the generator until the discriminator is not able to distinguish between the real image and the super resolution image created by the generator. So that means that the model learned how to increase resolution of the image. And in order to understand if whether this algorithm works for my problem or not, I'm course reading ERA-5 data, which is reanalysis data, to a resolution that is similar to the semi 6 models. And then I'm training the model to learn how to increase resolution of this and testing to see if the super resolution image created by this model is comparable with the real image of from, semi, from ERA-5 data. And I'm... I trained the model with daily sea ice concentration from 1981 to 2010. I validated from 2011 to 2020, and I tested for 2021 and 2022. And the other thing that I'm doing is that I'm performing a factorial experiment with sea surface temperature, snow depth, uh, surface heat flux, and sea ice convergence uh, to study which combination of these variables would give me the best performance of the model. Um, so my study area is the Vutikiski Strait, so I ran the model for all of this area, but I'm basically analyzing just for the straight area. And I'm also analyzing the shoulder months that are the transition months. So for example, late fall, when open waters become ice covered, like October and November. 
Um, so can C super resolution GAN algorithm effectively enhance the resolution of CIS concentration in the Arctic Straits compared to more traditional um, methods of interpolation? So here I'm comparing the experiment that was training only with C ice concentration. So I'm not using the other variables, just um, super resolution again and C ice concentration and comparing that with nearest neighbor and bilinear interpolation. So here in this first row, I have October 1st of 2021 and the second row, I have November 1st of 2022. Um, and then this first column is the difference between nearest neighbor and the high resolution image, which is the original error five data. Uh, the second column is the difference between bilinear interpolation and high resolution image. And the third one is the difference between super resolution image and high resolution image. And I also have these metrics uh, to help understand the performance of the model. And the first thing to notice is that the errors are smaller with super resolution, resolution image compared to nearest neighbor and bilinear interpolation what can also be seen in the metrics. And October being a month with more open water compared to November of this specific year shows that the model uh, does a better job representing sea ice concentration in ice covered months than in ice melting months. But even though it's better than um, the other uh, more common um, interpolation methods. So what combination of variables yields the most effective solution for improving the sea ice concentration resolution in the Arctic Straits. Here I have uh, the average root mean square error plotted for 2021 and 2022 for all the 16 experiments. And the average RMSC is higher during summer compared to ice covered months in winter. And experiments four, five, and one uh, all outperformed the other ones. And another thing that I think is very interesting is that um, experiment 16, which is just the model the model was just trained with CIS concentration. It's not even the top three of this um, kind of rank. So it's very interesting how including other variables that matter for CIS formation in the straight uh, improve the performance of the model. And uh, my key findings are that the super resolution again outperforms traditional interpolation methods such as nearest neighbor interpolation and bilinear interpolation. Um, experiments four, five, and one demonstrate the best results among all the 16 experiments. And my next steps would be investigate further the combination of these variables and how they impact the super resolution process and apply this methodology in the SMAP6 models. Um, these are my references. Um, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, so again, if you have questions, you can uh, unmute or uh, raise your hand to get my attention. Um, so I'm a little bit slow with, with machine learning, but uh, my understanding here is that you used ERA-5 at two different resolutions, uh, the quarter, to the 25 kilometer uh, resolution and 100 kilometer resolution in order to train the, the machine learning. Uh, yes. than to look at the, the CMIP-6. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about um, other, you know, just straight up observational CIS data sets like um, uh, MODIS or, or something higher resolution that might get you more information about what is ha actually happening in the straits as opposed to, you know, just the ERA-5 gridded. Yeah, so there are a bunch of things um, that I thought before like choosing the data. And one of the things that is very important when you're training um, any kind of like machine learning algorithm is the time. So um, the longest period that I could have first would be with era five because it's, um, it's longer. But I also pondered trying to use um, SAR uh, products. Sorry. Oh yeah, and, yes. that would be good. Yeah, so maybe in the next experiment. Okay, did you use the full era five time series then? Did you go back to 1940 or did you go back or did you just use the satellite era? Um, so I I trained the with the WMO normal. So it was from 
the, like daily data from 1981 to 2010, and then yeah. I validated. Okay. Yes, because that was also um, thinking about how ice is changing. So I couldn't go back that further because it's not going to represent what is going on right now in that area. Okay. I'm wondering if fast ice occurs in these narrow straits and that the fact that you see more dependence on other variables in era five is might be, you know, an indication that, you know, these other processes are creating fast ice or something like that. And that that's, that's what you're seeing. Do you, would you speculate about that? Well, I've been thinking about that lately a lot and maybe for a next experiment, trying to use a model that resolves fast ice a little bit um, better than era five is doing right now. But for now, I'm, I'm believing that era five is um, at some point representing fast ice in the coastal region of the, the strait. Okay. And so your your next directions then, you might think about using other data sets or, or what, do you, what do you plan to do next? Well, um, I'm planning definitely to think about fast size and um yeah other data sets to see how the model is going to to perform and then yeah maybe other other variables too uh, maybe yeah okay thank you any, any other questions for maria okay thanks very much maria thank you um, And so our next speaker then is Claire Hines from Penn State. And the title of her talk is Modeling Water and Sediment Transport in Arctic River Deltas to Estimate Fluxes to the Coast. Hi, Claire. Who is your advisor? Uh, my advisor is Anastasia Poloris. OK, great. And you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, you're seeing it in presenter view. And there we go. Okay, I get yeah. it now, yeah. Cool. All right, thanks everyone for um, showing up on the Zoom and inviting me to give this talk. So I'll be talking about, again, modeling water and sediment transport in Arctic deltas to estimate fluxes making it to the Arctic Ocean. Um, and I'm a grad student at Penn State. Um, so some background on this is that we have these very large watersheds in the Arctic um, and several of them terminate in deltas. And so even though we have estimates of the suspended sediment concentration and of discharge um, in these rivers going into the deltas, we don't have a great idea of what's actually making it to the coast because we know that the deltas are modifying the fluxes of sediment and water by distributing them within the delta and potentially eroding and depositing sediment. Um, and so we have these estimates from upstream, but again, we they all terminate in delta, so we don't know what's reaching it the coast, but we do know that there is sediment reaching the coast and that it matters for delta growth and for turbidity and then um, marine primary productivity in the coastal um, waters. And so we want to better understand the, the timing of the sediment fluxes reaching the coast and then where and how much sediment is reaching the coast. And so the goal of my project is to use these upstream data of suspended sediment concentration and discharge that we have for each of these rivers and then to model the processes happening within the deltas so that we can better quantify um, the distribution and timing of these fluxes reaching the Arctic Ocean. And so the processes that I want to focus on are flux partitioning between distributary channels. So we want to think about where the water is going in the deltas and when, and then also like where the sediment goes. We want to think about potentially channel island hydrologic connectivity. So thinking about overbank flooding from the channels onto the islands of the deltas and what that means for sediment movement and deposition. And then we want to think about erosion and deposition that can occur within the channels and on the islands, because these are all going to affect the sediment fluxes reaching the coast and the magnitudes and um, the timing of the sediment fluxes reaching the coast. And so kind of to go into the basics of the model design, um, the model is network based. And so that means that we take imagery of the delta, each delta, and we turn it into a binary mask saying this is land or this is water. And then we run it through a program that creates a graph of each delta that tells us about where the channels are and different information about the channels, like their width and length, um, and then where the channels come together, where they separate, um, and all of this information so that we have 
something to model on that isn't too complex. Um, and then the model is um, reduced complexity and non-morphodynamics. So what that means is we're not focusing on all of the processes that could possibly happen in the delta, but we're focusing in on like the key ones that we think are important. And then we're not thinking about um, the delta channels moving over time because they're relatively stable in these Arctic deltas. And so kind of the key steps for, for the model are to input the discharge and suspended sediment concentration. Those are what we have from the upstream Arctic Great Rivers Observatory and from stream gauges. And then at each link and node, we're going to partition discharge based on channel width. That's just saying that if it's a bigger channel, it's going to get more of the discharge. And then we want to think about discharge, making it from the channels and into the islands, and then what that means for deposition within the islands. Because if there's like a lot of vegetation or a lot of lakes in the islands, then there's more opportunities for sedimentation in the islands. Um, we also want to consider erosion and deposition within each of the channels using velocity thresholds, which basically say that when the velocity is high in the channel, we're going to erode some sediment. When it's low, we deposit some sediment. Um, and then so we do this on each of the links of each delta channel network, and then we can pass the information down to the next set of links until we eventually get a distribution of sediment fluxes and water fluxes within the delta, and then have an idea of the sediment fluxes reaching the coast of each delta. So this here we're showing the sediment fluxes on each of the deltas, um, and this is colored so that in the channels, if it's a dark blue color, it's a low sediment flux. If it's a, it's a light yellow color, it's a high sediment flux. And then on the coastline of each delta, the bubbles are so that the larger, darker bubbles are getting more of the total sediment flux than a smaller, uh, lighter bubble. So from this, we can see that the sediment fluxes are decreasing as we go down delta towards the coast. Um, that's expected because there's distribution of the sediment through these throughout these various channels, and we also have a lot of deposition. Um, but we can also see at the coast that the sediment fluxes are distributed to re relatively unevenly. So there's like some areas that are getting a lot of sediment in some of these deltas, whereas others are not getting very much. Um, and it's kind of consistent that all of these deltas have an uneven distribution of fluxes, but that largely has to do with where there's the big channel. So a bigger channel is going to be able to carry more sediment to the coast than a smaller channel. Um, we can also look at how the sediment fluxes vary seasonally. Um, so here I'm just showing the monthly sediment fluxes at the inlets and outlets for each month over the summer season when these deltas are active. Um, and so here in green is the, what's going into the delta, and what's in purple is the total of what's coming out of the delta. We can see that in terms of what's going into the delta in green, they all have relatively similar patterns where June, there's a lot of sediment going into the delta and then other months it kind of tapers down. Um, but they all have kind of different patterns in terms of what's actually making it to the coast. So we can't assume that these deltas are trapping the same amount of sediment month to month or that each delta traps the same amount compared to other deltas. Um, and so, for example, like the Colville is able to store a lot of sediment in June, but maybe not as much in other months. The NSA isn't storing that much sediment at all, um, whereas like the Yukon is storing a lot of sediment. So we have this kind of seasonal differences between each of the deltas and between each month. Um, and then we can consider how net storage over the entire season varies from delta to delta. And we see that it varies about from 10 to 70 percent of the total sediment going into each delta um, is stored within the delta. And so here I'm showing a lot of figures, <laughs> but the first figure on the left is showing the net summer storage. We can see that the Yukon is storing quite a bit of sediment and then it's decreasing down to the NSA storing not very much of the incoming sediment. Um, in the this figure, I'm showing delta complexity, where if it's on the top right of the figure, it's a larger, more complex delta. In the bottom left, it's a smaller, less complex delta. And then in the next figure, I'm showing summer suspended sediment concentration and discharge, where suspended sediment concentration is on the y-axis and discharge is on the x-axis. And then the next plot, I'm showing normalized hydrograph. So that's just showing the discharge throughout the entire uh, year. And so if we kind of look at all of these figures, we can see that a larger, more complex delta is going to be able to store a lot of sediment. Um, a delta that has high suspended sediment concentration inputs is also going to be able to store a lot of sediment, and a delta with a less flashy hydrograph. So that's like the Yukon and McKinsey, where they kind of taper off here um, more slowly than like the Yenisei, um, is also going to be able to store the most sediment. 
And so it's kind of this like competition between these various factors that kind of control the net storage over the entire summer season. Um, and so all of these are important to consider whenever we're thinking about how much sediment is making it to the coast. And so for my conclusions, we can see that the sediment fluxes are relatively constant over time between these deltas, but the, the magnitudes of the sediment fluxes, of course, vary with what's going into the delta. Um, and then we see these periods of potentially erosion and deposition, but the deltas are net depositional overall, as they should be, because they're deltas, so they should be storing a lot of sediment. Um, and then we can see that these deltas have various um, amounts of storage uh, during the summer, and that that's due to differences in their size and complexity and the upstream inputs of discharge. And so what this means is that some deltas, like the Yukon and the Colville and the McKinsey, might be more able to store more sediment during the season. They might be um, so they might be more resilient to land loss because of sea level rise. Um, and then also is important for just like what the fluxes are at the coast and how that's going to impact the turbidity and marine primary productivity. All right. All right. And then with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. Are there any questions for Claire? So... Claire, you showed um, you estimated the um, the channel widths from from satellite data. Yeah. Um, you kind of alluded to some in situ gauge data. Was there any other gauge data that uh, you was there was there other in situ data that you used? So the in terms of like discharge, what's going into the deltas? There's only um, gauges upstream of these deltas and not within the deltas. Um, so there's no like in situ discharge or sediment gate, um, sediment data within the deltas. Um, but we do use satellite imagery to understand like the delta network and uh, how much vegetation there is and things like that. OK. Yeah. Is there any other information that could possibly be taken from the satellite data, such as the, um, you know, is the, is the coloring of the, of the imagery uh, reflective of the amount of sediment in the channel? Can that possibly be used? Yeah. So we have looked at turbidity and how, the, and so you would think that like, if there's more sediment in the channel, then it would be higher turbidity. And I kind of compared that with the model results and it does like a decent job of matching up with that, but there are a lot of other things that can influence the turbidity. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's surprising that it worked at all. That's that's interesting. It does a better uh, job on some, some deltas than the others, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Wilbert has a question. Wilbert? Yeah, good question for me, Claire. Uh, very nice. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Um, so my question is um, related to the, the dynamics in the in the model. Is there any um, ar Arctic-specific uh, properties there, like uh, ice cover or permafrost, or is, in principle, this version of your model applicable to um, any delta? Yeah, so the model could be applied to any delta, um, but this model for the Arctic to make it like applicable to the Arctic does consider when there's ice in the channels because that's going to affect overbank flooding and like the water depth in the channels. So I do consider that. Uh, Claire, are you able to estimate the amount of sediment that does not reside within the um, uh, the, the the channel then that, that makes it into the Arctic Ocean? Yeah, so I have, I guess, like what the distribution of sediment flux is at the coast. So then that's what makes it to the ocean. Okay. So we would assume. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, and then our final speaker today is Ian Baxter uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Are you still at the University of California, Santa Barbara, or are you now at PNNL? Uh, I am still at UC Santa Barbara. Um, okay. I was visiting PNNL last year. Okay. And the title of your talk is Importance of Land Source Poleward Moisture Transport for the Summertime Arctic Water Vapor Feedback. And who is your advisor then at, at Santa Barbara? Uh, my advisor is Qinghua Ding. Okay. Uh... You and can see we, I can see your slides. All right. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ian Baxter. I'm a grad student at UCSB. Um, and I want to thank ARPIC for the opportunity to present today. 
Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge that this work was made possible by support from the CSM Polar Climate Modeling Working Group, um, as well as through the DOE's SCGSR program, which as well as at PNNL and the Highlight RASM project. Uh, the kind of motivation for this study stems from these kinds of plots from Pithen and Morrison back in 2014, and more recently from Po Chung Chung and Nicole Fettel that you might have seen yesterday at one of the IOPIC seminars that Po Chung presented at. Um, here, these plots, they show summer warming or the contribution to summer warming within the Arctic on the x-axis, and then the contribution to winter warming on the y-axis. And the ones that I want to point out are these water vapor um, feedbacks or radiative effects. And they contribute really strongly, the second most of any of the feedback processes to summertime warming, as opposed to very small um, contributions to wintertime warming. And so the idea here is to kind of understand what's contributing to this uh, summertime water vapor warming um, in the models and then try to compare it with observations. And so to do that, we're using two tools and we're combining them together. The first tool is called moisture tagging. And so we're taking the isotope enabled community earth system model version one, or I'll refer to it as ICSM1. Um, and we're tracing moisture or water vapor as it's evaporated and tagging it and then tracing it to when it's precipitated out. And so we're going to look at transport into the Arctic. Uh, the second tool that we're using is nudging. And so in this case, we're nudging uh, the horizontal winds U and V, as well as temperature T uh, to the air five reanalysis. And so the idea here is that Previous studies with the ICSM from Hansi Singh and Tyler Harrington uh, have generally used the free running model with um, its own inherent circulation. And this might be different than the uh, observed or re the observed circulation that we see in, say, ERA 5. Um, and so the idea here is to try and replicate ERA 5 and see where the different sources of moisture. Um, are coming from and how that's being transported to the Arctic. So on the right here, the two plots, uh, the upper plot is showing June, July, August, or JJA, total column precipitable water. Um, and if you compare the blue line with the orange line, so this is comparing ICSM1 with ERA5, uh, you can see with the nudging, we're really replicating year-to-year -year changes as well as the long-term trends in total column precipitable water. And then in the bottom plot, we're also capturing summertime uh, total precipitation as well. Um, and one of the first things that we wanted to look at was looking at atmospheric rivers or ARs. So the plots on the left are showing uh, trends across the ERA-5 record um, in atmospheric river frequency or occurrence. And so the darker green shading is showing a higher or an increasing occurrence of atmospheric rivers. And so here it's showing air five versus ICSM one again. And again, we're getting this good consistency. Um, but I think what uh, stands out in these plots is there's three major pathways that these atmospheric rivers are transporting into the Arctic. So one is here in central Eurasia, another one is over Siberia. And then the last one is here over kind of Western Greenland, Northeastern Canada, and this one is kind of a diversion from the North Atlantic pathway and, and to the other side of Greenland in this case. Um, here on the right, I'm showing uh, just the time series of atmospheric river frequency or occurrence within the Arctic. And again, I think you can see this increasing trend in atmospheric river occurrence, um, as well as maybe some decadal uh, variability imprinted onto that trend. Uh, another thing that I want to point out here is that about 80 to 90 percent of the moisture transport in these simulations is occurring um, in these atmospheric rivers. And the one I want to focus on is this one by Western Greenland, where it's um, about 92 percent of that transport is coming in atmospheric rivers. Uh, one of the interesting things with this uh, transport of the western side of Greenland that I was focusing on is in our previous study, we were looking at atmospheric circulation and again, using this kind of nudging approach. And so on the left is showing uh, composites of 200 hectopascal geopotential heights to show you circulation um, from air interim versus on the right, it's showing it from the CESM1 pre-industrial control simulation. 
and in these comparisons, what we found was that the model, the model struggled to capture this anticyclonic circulation over Greenland here on the right panel uh, relative to the reanalysis. And so the model, again, in the free running configuration is kind of struggling to capture this anticyclonic circulation and therefore the diversion of atmospheric rivers to the west of Greenland. Um, sorry, if you can hear that. Um, and so looking at the moisture transport here, I'm showing the trends in the contribution of each of our 54 regions uh, to our changes in Arctic water vapor. Um, and so the dark green squares here are really highlighting the major regions of evaporation that's contributing to this transport. And so again, we're seeing this Northeastern Canada region, uh, as well as over here in Eurasia, kind of in the band from 50 to 70 degrees north. Um, and so uh, when we've looked at these, one of the things that we're interested in understanding is how much the local changes in evaporation were contributing versus remote changes uh, in moisture transport. And what we find is about 65% of the changes in Arctic water vapor during summertime are coming from outside the Arctic and specifically coming from these land regions in this kind of 50 to 70 degree north band. Uh, and again, I just want to highlight this region here. It's labeled as region 47. That's what the numbers are referring to um, for that kind of North American Western Greenland transport pathway. Uh, I'm highlighting that again because uh, to quantify the impacts of these, this moisture transport on the Arctic system, uh, what we did is we took the CAM5 radiative kernels done by Angie Pendergrass, um, and we calculated the water vapor feedback um, associated with each of these regions that we tagged in the model. Uh, so the plot on the left is showing pressure on the y-axis and each of the regions on the x-axis, so it's averaged within the Arctic. And then on the right is showing the contribution to that 70 to 90 degrees north uh, water vapor feedback associated with each region again. And so again, I wanna point out that this region 47, Northeastern Canada is the largest contributor to the wa summertime water vapor feedback. It contributes about a quarter of the water vapor feedback. Um, and it has such a strong sensitivity to this region because it's kind of uh, transport is occurring throughout the column is what it seems like. And so, um, I want to emphasize the vertical extent of moisture transport and how that affects the water vapor feedback. And so just to kind of summarize, uh, with the nudging and the moisture tagging, we're able to replicate Arctic moisture changes and precipitation that we see in ERA-5 within the ICSM and trace it back to its source regions. And I want to emphasize this North American pathway that sources its moisture from land and is the strongest contributor to the summertime Arctic water vapor feedback. Um, and I think just going forward, uh, I've been interested in the seasonality and extending this to seasonality. So leaving the community with the question of what are the key differences and in interactions between seasons that contribute to polar amplification and change? And so thank you. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss more. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, I need to think about this a little bit. Um, I'm kind of... Uh, a little bit. I'm I'm kind of surprised that the moisture sources then are mainly over the over land as opposed to ocean. Can you mm -hmm. provide a explanation for that? Uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, I'm not exactly sure what processes specifically are contributing to this uh, dominance of land, but it occurs mainly during summertime. So. During winter time, the main sources are really coming from like the North Atlantic or North Pacific Ocean. And so um, I think maybe it has to do with the changes in kind of like surface cover, maybe like Third, snow and, I'll show and some freezing and things like that. Here, here and here. It, this is going to help not cut your body in half and is. Sorry, I, I think. Uh... Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, perhaps uh, it might be due to um, summertime baroclinicity over the land surfaces, which which might be missing over the ocean surfaces. How about that? Yeah, I think that I think that could be a possibility. Um, it's an interesting. Yeah, I should look at that. 
So okay. I just try try quickly to add that this tagging actually when um, precipitation fall onto the land surface, it stopped tagging. Eventually, the moisture are, are actually from ocean, right? The evaporation. But the model in the model, once precipitation fall on the surf soil uh, land surface, it stopped tagging. But the more direct in the summer, in the, like uh, Ian said, even that. In the winter, other seasons probably more predominantly from ocean. So, Hailong, you're suggesting that the the tagging mechanism then is is responsible for why it's coming from why it's indicating land as opposed to ocean. Yeah, if you trace back the okay. the precipitation soil moisture, they they have to be from ocean. Okay. Yeah. Wilbert has his hand raised. Wilbert. Yeah, I think I saw Hannah also. Um, Hannah, do you have a question that you want to ask first? Me? Yeah. Sorry, I don't have my hand raised. No, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay, okay. Uh, so, in your, uh, Ian, on your last slide, um, the box 47 was, was very red, but there was a box south of that that was kind of very blue. I was wondering, um, what is the, what does that mean? What, what is the meaning of that? Uh, yeah, that's that's a really good question. That was something I was really interested in or, and surprised to see as well. Um, and so I think it kind of goes to this uh, idea of looking at the vertical extent of transport and where the moisture is going to. Um, so from what I, what I think is happening is, so 47, the transport kind of occurs at lower levels um, and throughout the troposphere. But for 41, which um, for everyone is centered over kind of the continental US, uh, the moisture transport seems to get lifted really high. And so it's going kind of towards the upper troposphere, troposphere and maybe into the stratosphere. And so uh, it's not being included so much in the uh, radiative kernels since I cut them, cut them off at like 300 hectopascals just to do the tropospheric um, radiative impacts. Um, and so I think that's what's happening there. Okay. So thank you again. It was a very Thanks nice presentation. Over it. Uh, Ian, I was wondering if you could review the definition your the definition that you use for atmospheric river, and do you think that the 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 way that it's defined is that is that a significant sensitivity to the the numbers you showed about how how important they are? Um. I think it's uh, definitely a factor. So I've been using the uh, Guan and Walliser 2015-2019 uh, definition of atmospheric rivers. Um, the way I understand it, it's uh, a pretty uh, lenient, I think is maybe the way to describe it, uh, algorithm for detecting atmospheric rivers. So in terms of the contribution, it's maybe overestimating it compared to probably other uh, AR detection and tracking algorithms that you might be using. Okay. So. Great. Thanks very much again. Um, we have about four minutes remaining. Um, I was wondering if uh, any of the, the four presenters might want to comment on their experiences at AGU. Um, was this your first time when you went to AGU and um, as a student, uh, do you think um, you know you were able to make contacts and uh, uh, and ad advance you know your work? Would it, would any of the four of you like to respond to that? Um, I guess I could. Go ahead. Um, this was my second time going to AGU. I went. Uh, in 2019, but when it was in San, the last time it was in San Francisco. Um, but for me, uh, this AGU was a really great experience. Uh, I think, especially with uh, getting the opportunity to present this time, uh, I got a lot of feedback, a lot more feedback, I think, as opposed to the poster and uh, got to talk to more, like a different set of people, I think, um, than I would have otherwise. And so that was a really good experience for me to kind of connect and network and things like that. So 
I mean, this has been my experience recently. If you give a poster, you're able to actually convey information and exchange information with with a presenter. Whereas if you're given a 10 minute talk, it's it's not a um, it's a little bit more more difficult. Um, Hannah, I believe you gave a, a talk at AGU. Was was that your experience, or or did you think it was a, a good experience at AGU? Um, it was also my second time at AGU, and okay. um, last time I had a poster, and this time I had a talk. And I do know that most people get more interaction at a poster, and I definitely think I had more interaction at a poster, but I still got a decent amount of interaction with the talk as well, and still was was able to network quite a bit. So, two for two good experiences. Okay. That sounds great. Um, it is now the top of the hour. So I would again like to thank very much all of the presenters. Um, again, uh, a recording of this will be available on the IARPIC website. Um, I don't know if I want to say, I think our February is open on the modeling calendar. Um, I think that's it. Tony, is there anything else we need to add? No, I don't think so. Um, yes, the recording will be posted on the event page, likely toward the end of this week, but it's usually within a week that it's live. But want to thank all of our speakers again and everyone for attending this afternoon. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.